For much of its near 30-year history, PlayStation has been considered by many to be the king of the mountain. From its early days, with the one-two platformer punch of Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon to a golden age of RPGs, games that still define this console family four generations later to the historic PlayStation 2 years, debuting dozens of beloved franchises like Sly Cooper, God of War, Ratchet & Clank, Shadow of the Colossus, and Jack and & Daxter, games that evoked this sense of exploration, adventure, growth, and most importantly, joy. To the more modern eras, defined by Sony's internal development teams pushing the ceiling for gaming ever higher, whether it's Uncharted, Ghost of Tsushima, Gravity Rush, The Last of Us Horizon, a complete reinvention of God of War, if I, if I, if I don't mention Knack here, one of you's gonna hurt me, the PlayStation family has never stopped growing. You would think, then, that celebrating this family history would be a no-brainer. Well, in November 2012, they finally got the brains, and after years upon years of PlayStation fans asking for it, begging for it, we were given our big PlayStation crossover, an indie studio-developed crossover game that pissed just about everybody off, a game that will forever be seen as a total failure. I've talked about PlayStation All-Stars on this channel before. It's a game that's important to me, admittedly less for the game itself as time goes on, and more for the community that surrounded it, the friends that I made, and technically because you could draw a direct line from my experiences with All-Stars to me making the Golden Bolt in the first place. So, as we passed its 10th birthday recently, I couldn't help but keep finding All-Stars popping back into my mind. Of course, that's just me. It's a game that you probably remember best for being the Sony Smash Bros that everybody clowns on because, well, the real Smash Bros was able to lock down iconic PlayStation mascots like Cloud and Snake, while this one, the actual PlayStation Smash, couldn't get either of those two, or Crash, or Spyro, or even some first-party characters, thanks to studio infighting. This game, looking back, was doomed to fail, and All-Stars only looks worse with age, both figuratively because Nintendo turned Smash into a game that's almost bigger than video games at this point, and more literally because, frankly, a lot of PS3 games just kinda look like shit. But it's more importantly than that, a game whose completely unintended legacy actually grows over time, even if we don't realize it. This was, looking back, a breaking point for how Sony approached its audience, how it approached synergizing its games and the whole PlayStation brand. PlayStation All-Stars, despite actually selling better than expected, was emblematic of Sony's struggle to get its fanbase to actually buy more than one or two of its first-party PS titles, a brand-wide failure in marketing that even Kevin Butler couldn't fix. It's in part thanks to this game that PlayStation Studios hit the reset button, focusing on games, styles, and concepts that would appeal to wide swaths of the same crossover audiences, instead of every individual game reaching into its own niche. Now, whether that's a good thing or not is down to your personal taste. Personally, not a huge fan. But again, Sony began training that taste with regard to the general audience, pushing a brand identity and driving fans to look forward to and consume most, if not all, PlayStation Studios titles. Once again, uh, while well, taking a page from Nintendo's book. <laughs> well, what else is new, right? And... It worked. Before the All-Stars wake-up call, you were lucky to find more than a handful of first-party PlayStation titles that broke 3 million sales, and almost all of those were uncharted. Since then, they've had a ton of games break the 10, 15, 20 plus million mark, creating new and iconic characters that, funnily, would fit perfectly in a crossover video game. PlayStation All-Stars certainly wasn't the only game to lead to this shift, more, it was the final straw, a missed opportunity of a game that itself spawned far better opportunities. And yet its legacy, as far as most of us are concerned, is that of a shameless Smash clone, which, on one hand, yes, that, that is very true, but I think boiling it down to that does this game a disservice. Its real legacy, the one that we've all forgotten with time and snide remarks and half-hearted YouTube videos that skip over a lot of the history here, it isn't quite that. This is the story of a passion project made by an underdog indie studio full of eager fighting game players and designers who perhaps weren't quite ready for the challenge. It's the story of a game with two years of planned character DLC, free character DLC at that, plans that were cut short due to publisher intervention, a constantly changing scope, and promises unkept. But this is also the story of a small fan base that kept the game going, a grassroots movement that actually forced a multi-billion dollar company to cave. This is the story of, in my opinion, PlayStation's most important failure. This 
is PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. October 5th, 2011. PlayStation uploads a video to its YouTube channel, a commercial titled Michael. Part of the new Long Live Play marketing campaign, Michael was two minutes of pure, unfiltered nostalgia, featuring dozens of PlayStation and general gaming icons, all telling their stories, reminiscing, each with one focus. Michael! Michael. Michael. Michael is you. You were the one that helped Kratos in his fight against the gods. You kept Solid Snake pushing onward when war kept changing. You were responsible for all of it. Every moment that you remember in your gaming journey, every action that stuck out, every jump that you made, and every jump that you missed, it was all because of you. As the camera begins panning up, you see all of the hundreds of pictures of different Michaels, each from different backgrounds, that each had this sole thing in common, a love of play. There was even a customizable version of this commercial online where you could put your own picture in place of Michaels and have the crowd of characters chanting your name, if you had a name common enough that they'd recorded it, at least. Yes, it was marketing at the end of the day, but it was made with such care and detail that it could resonate equally with anybody. This commercial wasn't going to sell a PlayStation 3 or anything, it was going to make you feel nostalgic, and it worked. Every time I watch this video, and even right now talking about it, I genuinely get goosebumps because of all the different moments that my mind flashes to, not all of them limited to Sony games. It brings me back to my childhood, to long, late night drives when it was too dark to see my Game Boy screen anymore, so I would stare at the telephone poles or the guardrails on the sides of the road and imagine that Ratchet or Sly were sliding on those wires like they were rails, just to make the ride go by just a little bit faster. These characters were more to me than just experiences, than just moments of play. They were, at times, family, when my own family maybe wasn't always there. So when I first saw this video as somebody who had moved on to the Xbox 360 and to Halo and other games that weren't necessarily PlayStation, this short two minutes affirmed that all of these years sitting on my ass and experiencing these magical worlds, both real and unreal, both PlayStation and not, it all meant something. And it didn't just hit home for me. The Michael ad received near universal praise. It was that celebration that fans wanted. Surely any future celebrations would perform swimmingly after a start like that. Oh, this, folks, was the public response to PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, Sony's new four-player crossover fighting game with a title as long as its roster. Over 30% dislikes on an E3 trailer with the comments loaded with insults and snide remarks. Now, I realize, actually, that 30% might not sound too bad anymore. Dislike bombing got a bit more prevalent in the last decade, and that probably says a lot about us, but back then, whew, this was bad. The official reveal trailer and the Michael spot while we're on the subject have both been removed from the PlayStation YouTube channel, but let's just say that people lightened up by the time this E3 trailer had dropped. How did things shift so drastically from love and good vibes to infighting and vitriol? Part of the answer is found in the comments of any video related to the game, including this one here, I can almost guarantee it. Scroll down during any All-Stars related discussion and you'll find countless comments that follow one of two major themes, the first being, this is a ripoff of Super Smash Bros. Hey, gl glad you noticed. Very astute observation there, champ. For everybody that already typed that comment before getting to this part of the video, by the way, you now owe me a like or subscribe. Your choice, I don't make the rules. The game upon reveal, however, showed a few key differences to attempt to differentiate from Smash, most notably in the method of defeating your opponents. Rather than KOing your foes by knocking them off the stage, the only way to win in All-Stars was to use regular attacks to build up a super meter to level 1, 2, or 3, and unleash that super on your opponent. Additionally, every stage in All-Stars had interactive hazards and mashed up two different franchises on top of it. For example, halfway through fighting on Jack and Daxter's Sandover Village, you would get pelted by golfers teeing off in Hot Shots Golf. If you fought on Hades from God of War, Hades himself would get attacked by Patapon, which is just amazing. Parappa the Rapper's Dojo level would get invaded by a goddamn Metal Gear, and so would the Loco Roco... Kin Kingdom? What kind of domain do the Loco Roco... What, what are they... Are they a democracy? I, I don't really care. There's a lot of Metal Gear invasion in this game. They really had fun with it. 
Fledgling developer Superbot Entertainment took inspiration from the leader of the genre. At the time, the only one in the genre, if we're really being honest. Smash was the only show in town at the time, and Superbot had their orders to make the game a certain way. Orders that kept changing. Regardless, they continued looking for unique ways to stand out, to potentially add to the formula and appeal to the fighting game community, especially seeing as how Nintendo was missing opportunities by having a clear aversion to the competitive scene in Smash. Naturally, though, gamers took their battle positions. You'd often find people calling this game both a ripoff and a stupid one at that because it dared to change things that they liked from Smash. Many of these commenters, because more people cared about the weird console war stuff back then, and also Sony had just ripped off the Wii with the PlayStation Move, so uh, kind of uh, probably fair to go after Sony for ripping off Nintendo, they were just Nintendo fans simply defending their turf in their eyes. Whatever the reason may be, PlayStation All-Stars did not receive even a room temperature reception from gamers. The super system of fighting in particular was the subject of debate for months before and even years after Battle Royale's launch. People complained from looking at footage that attacks didn't feel like they mattered, since you weren't doing damage to an enemy, you were just building meter for yourself. The risk-reward mechanic of the supers didn't quite click either. Folks didn't vibe with the potential metagame of saving your super meter until later for the stronger moves that are more likely to hit or get multiple kills versus just building your meter to level 1 and trying to knock out one foe at a time, but more of them because you can get level 1s faster. The game was a hotly debated topic all over forums and Twitter and everywhere else on the web that talked about stupid games like this whenever people didn't dismiss it immediately, that is. All the while, none of the people commenting had actually touched the game yet. This was all based on video trailers. Meanwhile, the world of gaming press saw things relatively differently from the masses commenting online. Critics who got a hands-on look at All-Stars generally were impressed by, or at least optimistic about it, and most were excited to see the game flesh out as it neared launch. Some reactions were of course more positive than others, but to the press, the game showed some level of promise. There would be this clear split between public and critic reactions for several months, even after the game's demo populated throughout stores and around the world, and its multiple online betas went live on the PlayStation Network. Once people did get to play All-Stars, their response, generally, started to warm up. However, people still couldn't acclimate to the unique mechanics, which is pretty fair, they're pretty weird mechanics. As insiders such as Greg Miller would later say after launch, Battle Royale's biggest weakness was that it looked like Smash Bros. That meant that people would play All-Stars like it was Melee or Brawl, have a bad time, and dismiss it. It wasn't really a pick-up-and-play game, which is a big no-no when the game is being set up as a pick-up-and-play party fighter, when the game looks like a party fighter, and you're going to lose people that way. I think during those press previews before release, having the hands-on time with the developers, that ability to talk to them and get an idea of how the game works or maybe what you're doing wrong, that went a long way towards press leaving with more positive experiences than folks who maybe tried out the public beta, didn't get it after a couple matches, and dipped because they got bodied by players spamming Kratos' overpowered square moves. Both are totally fair takeaways, and I think it signals a clear fault with the game's design if it takes that lengthy explanation to even start going, especially since that lengthy explanation is kind of lacking from the final release. The game's tutorial system isn't really all that good. Now, All-Stars being compared to or considered a knockoff of Smash was one of those general themes you'd see in the comments to this game before launch, but what was that second one I mentioned? The second biggest shortcoming of PlayStation All-Stars, and in turn the reason that it had the completely unintentional long-tail impact that it did, is an issue of timing. Superbot began development on Battle Royale in 2009. In fact, Superbot was created specifically for this game, drawing in both younger and more experienced developers, including many die-hard fighting game fans turned designers. However, despite having a clear fighting game lean to its design team, the first year of production actually focused on a different kind of game entirely. Superbot was instructed to create a vertical slice for a 4v4 capture the flag sort of game. The best analog I've heard for what this version looked like is an early sort of hero action MOBA game. Think maybe Smite, but not quite. But then in 2010, Sony's brass changed its mind, shifting the design to a one-screen experience, which settled into a Smash-styled game then known as Title Fight. 
According to former members of Superbot, characters were considered predominantly on a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately basis by Sony. None of the game's 16 first-party characters had been dormant for more than four years, and most had games actively in production or had plans on the way that would be out around the game's planned 2012 launch. This was much to the team's chagrin. Both early on and later with the post-launch DLC, Superbot staff often fought a losing battle with PlayStation higher-ups to include fan favorites rather than solely advertise recent projects. Since it's been so long since the game released, I think it's a good time to look at the roster in full for a second and explain the context behind some of the first-party roster choices, the baffling guidelines that Superbot was allegedly placed under, and how that led to some pretty notable exclusions. One of those guidelines, for example, was to be economical with the amount of time they had, so one character per franchise only, and don't forget there was that what-have-you-done-for-me-lately mindset that seemed to pervade a lot of these choices as well. So first we've got the obvious ones, Kratos, Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter, Sly Cooper, Nathan Drake, Sackboy from Little Big Planet, Sweet Tooth from Twisted Metal. Again, all of these are pretty obvious, good picks, and they all had games that were either in production or had just come out in 2009 when the roster had started to lock down. Then there are the legacy characters, such as Parappa the Rapper, Sir Dan from Medieval, Spike from Ape Escape. Some of these franchises had had games or remakes come out not long before 2009, but these were all leaning a bit more towards being classic reps. After that, we've got some that you might start to scratch your head at a little bit, like Nariko from Heavenly Sword, Fat Princess from Fat Princess, or Killzone's Colonel Raddick. Heavenly Sword 2 had been planned and then cancelled and then planned and then cancelled so many times around this point, so it was likely back in the uncancelled phase around when they locked in the roster. Colonel Raddick was one of the baddies in the extremely successful Killzone 2, so that one's kind of a no-brainer in 2009 that maybe then looks a bit strange in 2012, considering that, uh, um, he's not in Killzone 3, which came out in 2011, right before PlayStation All-Stars, so, uh, yeah, and it's even weirder now that Killzone has been dead for a decade. Fat Princess, same sort of deal. She was the actual flag in a multiplayer sort of capture the flag game that released in 2009 and quickly became one of the most successful download titles on the PlayStation Network around then. At the time, made sense. Three years later, maybe not, but that said, she actually did get a game on PS4 in 2015, so maybe she was more popular than any of us knew in 2012. I, d I doubt it. And then there's one of the controversial ones, actually controversial twos, I, I, I guess, both the good and evil karma versions of Cole McGrath from Infamous. Kinda goes against the one per series thing, don't you think? So this one's interesting because one of the directives, allegedly, was that Sony's internal studios had the final say on inclusion or even some facets of the characters that were represented in All-Stars. This is why, for example, Wander from Shadow of the Colossus was apparently a hard no. With the obtuse development of its successor The Last Guardian came some apparent tension between Sony and the game's director Fumito Ueda, to the point that in 2011, Ueda left Sony partway through production while finishing the game that would later come out, what was it, five years later? Was that 2016? Or was that 2017? When did that game come out? Hold on. Okay, 2016. So yeah, it came out five years after the director of the game left the publisher for the game, which is wild. That's a story for another day, but allegedly from what I've gathered from interviews with folks who worked on All-Stars, Wander was shut down because Ueda wanted no part of it. In that same vein, it was allegedly suggested, in quotes there, that there should be two different coals for each karmic path, rather than one coal whose moveset could change over the course of a fight or something. So, two coals it is. 10% uh, of this game's roster is, is Cole McGrath. That's, man, that, that's weird. And last, but certainly not least, of the Sony-owned part of the roster was Toro. He's, he's a cat. He's, he's just a cat. I love him so much. If you don't know who Toro is, he's one of Japan's PlayStation mascots who appeared in cameos all the time. He's not super common anymore. I think Astrobot kind of replaced him as far as Japan studio goes, but um, I still love Toro. He's A+, and I will accept no debate on that. Of course, first-party characters weren't all the PlayStation brand had to offer. The first decade or so of the console family's life was defined by games that Sony didn't itself own. Games like Final Fantasy, Metal Gear Solid, Devil May Cry, Resident Evil, Silent Hill, Tekken, Tomb Raider, and, of course, Crash and Spyro, not to mention the Grand Theft Autos of the world. 
It just wouldn't be a true PlayStation celebration if Superbot didn't also celebrate the independent franchises that helped hold down the fort at the start of the PlayStation's life. So they pulled strings, they made some deals, and they got Hihachi from Tekken. Great! They got Raiden from Metal Gear Rising. O okay, cool, I guess because Snake was just in Smash a year before, that, that works, it kind of makes sense. Plus, nowadays with how popular Rising's become over the years, that one kind of worked out pretty well. There's Big Daddy from... from Bioshock? Didn't that game come out a year late on PS3? You, you, know, you know what, whatever. Big Daddy was at the time one of the most iconic figures in gaming, I can kind of accept that. Plus, Bioshock was supposed to have a Vita. Is that Dante? Is that the weird, edgy Dante from the Devil May Cry reboot that we don't we don't talk about anymore? What? Why is... Wh why? That is pretty much verbatim the initial reaction to each of these four guest characters as they were revealed. Dante's reveal in July 2012, though, was the straw that broke the camel's back, and while outside viewers pointed and laughed from afar, pretty justifiably, even the fanbase excited for the game deflated immediately. Around this same time in the summer of 2012, the game's full roster was leaked by a user who data mined one of the betas. With a roster of only 20, the game received unfavorable and, in my opinion, kind of unfair comparisons to the third Smash game, Brawl, which had double that roster size. That alongside a character like New Dante, it, it drove the fanbase into this negative, downward spiral that irreparably damaged any reputation and hype that the game had built up in the prior few months. Players wanted the real Dante, not this cheap bootleg, and while we're at it, where the hell is Crash? Where's Spyro? Where's Lara Croft? Or Gex? Or Cloud? Or Sora? What, those last two, wow, those did not age well. What the hell kind of roster was this? And that's just it. The second biggest shortcoming of PlayStation All-Stars is one of timing. Had the game started production one year prior, the original Dante would have very likely been the one that made the cut instead of the newer Dante, or at the time, the newer Dante. Look at 2011's Marvel vs. Capcom 3. That game had the original Dante, not new Dante. Super Smash Bros. Brawl had come out just a year before its PlayStation counterpart would start development, so Snake was very clearly out of the equation. Most of the rest of those iconic PlayStation franchises that didn't make it into Battle Royale's roster were owned by two companies at the time, Activision and Square Enix. Square in 2009 had only just acquired the rights to Tomb Raider and Gex, and was in the middle of multiple corporate restructures and the development of Final Fantasy XIII. This was well before a Final Fantasy VII remake was even close to reality, because Square was very much about looking forward and finding success that way first, before looking back to the past. In other words, this 2012 fighting game was far more likely to get lightning than Cloud, and given how the internet had responded to her character back in the day, and this game's roster in general around the same time, well, I kind of actually want to live in that world for just a day to see the pure chaos that would have unfolded. And in Lara Croft's case, Superbot actually had reached out, but the timing didn't really land well since the Tomb Raider reboot was in production around then, and unlike Konami and Capcom with Raiden and Dante, Crystal Dynamics preferred to have the new Lara Croft debut in her own game, not somebody else's. Oh yeah, by the way, both of those games came out in 2013, months after All Stars released. So they were advertisement characters for games that were not even out yet. They apparently had left the door open for Lara Croft as potential DLC, but by that point, the game was already dead, so... Yeah. Also, I just realized uh, while editing, I called her Lara Croft for some reason. I don't I don't usually call her that. I go with Lara Croft, but uh, I guess this time it came out as Lara, so don't... don't hurt me. That leaves, of course, the big ones, Sony's first two real mascots, Activision's Crash and Spyro. Crash, in particular, was rightfully asked for, if not outright demanded by fans, every step of the way. The PR team at Superbot, after months of answering no comment, had begun issuing a go-to response when asked about Crash, it takes two to tango. We may never know exactly why Activision wouldn't tango, I mean, it's 100% money, we know for a fact it's money, but at the time, there seemed to be no way for them to even consider bringing the Bandicoot back, let alone licensing him out to Sony. Meanwhile, developer Toys for Bob was already hard at work developing a Spyro game that would eventually become Skylanders, and Activision had no interest in sharing that pie either. Again, I would have loved to see how the internet would have just exploded in response to Skylander Spyro being the version of Spyro that got into the game. It would have been really funny. 
Now, you've got to remember just how much the games industry has changed in the last decade since All Stars released, because it is shocking to put things side by side. Hell, even our entire media consumption in general has shifted. Binge watching wasn't a thing yet in 2012. Cable still ruled the day. Online passes were a constant with multiplayer games before loot boxes took over, and there was a hesitation for a while to rely on the oldies, as gaming audiences and tastes continued shifting in the early HD era. Outside of Nintendo, a lot of tried and true games or characters or even genres began falling out of favor faster than you might recall. But now? Crash and Spyro have both gotten full remakes, and Crash got a faithful fourth game at that. Dante is back to his old self after that weird detour, and he's doing better than ever. Nearly every Resident Evil game under the sun has been remade. Tomb Raider not only hit a renaissance, it's now owned by a completely different company than Square. Speaking of Square, Final Fantasy VII got its long-delayed remake, as well as the original getting a remaster and even coming to Nintendo, which is wild, a free-to-play smartphone remake slash remaster, an actual battle royale game that came out and then died within just a couple years, and even the Final Fantasy VII prequel has gotten a remaster. Kingdom Hearts 3 is real, and it's out. Actually, almost every meme this game is never coming out game has dropped besides Half-Life 3, including The Last Guardian. And of course, Cloud, Sephiroth, and Sora made their way into Smash, alongside Microsoft's Banjo-Kazooie and Minecraft Steve slash every other part of Minecraft, because, man, we were blessed when it came to Smash Ultimate. Just about everybody has become more open to cross-promotion over time, which just wasn't even close to the case in 2012. Most of those requested third-party characters, even a year or two later, had concrete plans surrounding them, which would have made them ripe for crossover promotion. The only characters left out of those early fan-favorite third-party requests are dormant characters like Gex, who's now owned by a new company, so it's frankly just a matter of time before that f***er shows back up, and the Metal Gear franchise. Had the production of All-Stars been shifted either up or down by even two years, the game would have looked entirely different just in terms of roster alone, not to mention that if it shifted two years back, it would be a PS4 game and have a completely different audience thanks to the whole way that the PS4 versus Xbox One launch turned out. But instead, what we did end up getting was a fan base tearing itself apart from the inside, a general audience just salting the wounds from the outside, and a developer with some sopping wet band-aids trying to cover as many broken hearts as possible. At this point in the game's lifespan, a few months out from launch, the fan base was, in a word, toxic. New Dante especially was a poison pill that seeped its way into even the most excited of fans. The core fanbase split among multiple forums, as the official PlayStation forums continued to bicker more and more, scaring people off into their own sub-communities. This is where I'd like to take you on a brief tangent to discuss my perspective at the time, to give you the other side of the coin. The side that was still somewhat excited about and looking forward to the game. See, by this point, All-Stars had become more than just another game for which I was excited. Initially, I wasn't even fond of the idea. I didn't care for real Smash Bros. at the time. Why should I care about some PlayStation variant? Only in the previous year had I scrounged together enough money to buy a cheap PS3. I had yet to experience all of the new franchises franchises that people wanted added. And that's not to mention that I was an N64 kid more than I was a PS1 one, so I kind of shrugged at many of the requests for those early era characters. I didn't have much investment in this game at all. Then, while browsing YouTube one day, I saw it. Michael. That ad from six months prior that I had come back to every so often, Michael was the same creative force behind PlayStation All-Stars, a celebration, a game for the players, by the players, but well before Sony actually used that phrase as marketing. It was a thank you to the almost two decades of PlayStation fans that had made this possible. And then, it kind of clicked. Later, I would find out that this connection was more than just a mental one that I'd made, as ads for Battle Royale would reintroduce the doorkeeper from Michael and that whole setting. This entire time, that Michael ad had been almost guerrilla marketing preparing consumers for this game. After that, I started to become invested. If Michael could elicit that kind of response from me consistently, even though I wasn't necessarily a big fan of a ton of the franchises featured in that commercial, the game that it was stealth marketing certainly might be able to do the same. I realized that, unlike with the first three Smash games, I 
had the chance to get in on the ground floor and learn the game alongside everybody else, rather than coming in a couple years later at a friend's house after they'd played the game nonstop for years on end and I was coming in fresh, getting bodied in itemless Final Destination matches, all while sitting there like an idiot confused about tilts and tap jumps and why the GameCube controller is such a monstrosity. And yes, I will die on that hill, I will continue dying on that hill, even now that I've gotten used to the GameCube controller for Smash, we've all been Stockholmed. Th three, three Stockholm. Th th that controller is garbage. No, no I, I don't really care that much. But at the time, man, I just had no chance, no environment to get into and learn the Smash games. This game having three simple attack buttons and a dedicated jump button by default, that genuinely probably did help pique my interest earlier on. So anyway, I became part of the community surrounding the game. I started taking part in discussions on those forums. I thought about my dream roster. At points, I even started thinking of potential combos just by watching gameplay before the beta had even reached my hands. As somebody who considered themselves as a kid to be predominantly a PlayStation player up to that point, which is funny to say now that I think about it because leading up to All-Stars I pretty much mostly played on 360, but you get my point, this game did become my Smash Bros. I'm conveniently also one of the people that didn't really care much about Devil May Cry New or Old, so the new Dante thing personally didn't sting too hard, although I did feel for everybody else. In an attempt mainly to keep myself excited for the game as it was being surrounded by people coming in and bombarding and actively trying to ruin the fun for others, but also to help give uh, but also to help give that core community a sort of rallying point, I began making these comprehensive daily and weekly forum threads leading up to the game's launch, discussing reveals, character highlights, theorizing mechanics, and so on. My god, this sounds fucking stupid. On a larger scale, this clearly didn't work, but that very obviously wasn't the point. The number of people that even discuss video games or any hobby online is a percentage of a percentage. Within that core community though, at times, it certainly did help a little bit. There was still a ton of arguing, name-calling, your usual internet stuff, but at times, that twinkle of hope, that twinkle of hype, returned to the fanbase. Uh, one last thing before we get to the launch, for the sake of disclosure here. Right around the time the game released, knowing how much constant vitriol the development team was getting, I decided to send a stupid little open letter to them. I, I didn't expect anything of it, it was just kind of some kind words to help counterbalance the negativity even a little bit. Something that I realize now, having dealt with YouTube comments for the better part of this past decade, it actually does go a long way. Even folks with the thickest of skin will tell you that usually one shitty comment can override a hundred good ones and stick out in your mind. The tree remembers, the axe forgets, that kind of thing. Now imagine that you, as a developer, actually might agree with those shitty commenters, but you're powerless to actually make the changes that you'd like to. To my surprise, the company's president personally responded. He read the letter aloud at the team meeting that morning, and one nice comment actually helped them in some small way as they crunched towards that finish line. Now, realistically, this story should end right there. It should be a pretty simple exchange of, hey, I hope you guys have a good launch. Uh, congratulations. Hopefully everything went well. Um, thank you for the work that you've done. Followed by, if any response, there really probably shouldn't be a response, but if there was any response, a, a kind, you know, thank you so much. Uh, hope you enjoy the game. Your words meant a lot. And that would be it. What instead happened was they rigged a post-launch giveaway contest so that I won. I, I had no say in this, they had insisted that they wanted to send me some spare shirts they had laying around from Gamescom or something like that, just as a little thank you. And these, by the way, were the absolute worst quality shirts, by the way. Like, one said, Team Kratos in really bad, bright yellow glitter that you couldn't even see on a gray shirt. It was, it was awful. But I didn't receive those shirts until about a month later, and in the meantime, I had just so happened to be randomly selected to win this contest they held, where if you posted a picture of yourself winning online with one of the pre-order costumes or something, you'd have a chance to win these pewter commemorative coins that were made for the dev team, featuring the first six fighters made for the game. Those coins and the two shirts they had sent arrived in the very same package, with a little letter that had thanked me for the email I'd sent and the usual uh, niceties, keep, keep in touch, that kind of thing. So yeah, they 100% totally rigged that contest. Again, just a disclosure, I had no say in the matter, I didn't tell them to rig it or anything. But I wanted to give you an idea of how keyed into this community Superbot was at times. It seems to me, and this is not uh, based on uh, too much insider info and interviews and stuff, they agreed with a lot of 
the complaints people had about things like perhaps Dante or the lack of Crash, and, and they were frustrated that they couldn't provide the game that they wanted to because of external politics or whatever it might have been. I know that I've heard from developers that worked on this game frustration about characters like Tomba, which by the way, I'll get into this later, were in production for DLC. Characters that were fan favorites that got pushed away from the initial roster that they saw fan demand for and that they were going to make into DLC that never happened because of that external pressure. And between all of that stuff and how they, they went out of their way to take care of their community, not just me specifically, I don't care about the coins, although it's, it's cool, whatever, they would send whole PS3 signed by the entire team or, or Vitas to people around the world who would uh, reach out and say, hey, I wanted to let you know I played the game at Gamescom or at uh, TGS or at E3, and I'm really excited to play it when I can get my hands on a PS3. And they would just go out of either pocket or whatever discretionary fund they maybe had and just do a nice thing, not advertise it, not talk about it. They would just do it because these folks just cared about the game they were making. And I know every developer on the ground floor tends to care about the game they're making, but uh, this one tends to get glossed over a lot as uh, a lazy cash-in or a greedy cash-in or whatever it might have been. And it's simply, that was not the case on the ground floor. And I think a lot of people miss that. So yeah, obviously this unscripted part of the video is not part of the usual uh, unbiased documentary retrospective, whatever I do here. Um, this is me very clearly laying out my disclosures so that you can call me a shill and you have the ammo too if you want to. I, I don't really care. I think these folks were pretty cool and they did a lot of cool things and they get a bad rap. On November 20th, 2012, PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale simultaneously released on the PlayStation 3 and PS Vita. Critical consensus was mostly in the vein of positive, but it could be better, with reviewers praising the fun combat, albeit often noting that it certainly took some getting used to if you came in with the Smash Bros. mindset. Critics loved the game's authenticity. Playing as Nathan Drake felt like you were playing a 2D Uncharted game, for example, thanks to his ridiculous moveset featuring kicking barrels at you, hiding behind waist-high concrete walls that suddenly would just appear, or throwing and shooting propane tanks as one of his special moves. This was true for practically every character. A painstaking amount of work had gone into making each fighter feel exactly as they should, for better or worse. Animations often felt ripped right from the source material, and Superbot had gone to great lengths to give several characters unique mechanics to accentuate the roster. Sly Cooper didn't have a block, for example. Instead, he could turn invisible. Fat Prince Princess relied more on stand characters to feature the different classes from her original game instead of fighting herself. Hell, Dante even had infinites, which is just correct. That was thanks to his ability to cancel any of his square attacks into any triangle attack, and in turn cancel any triangle attack into a circle attack. For all the other issues the game ran into, a painstaking amount of effort went into representing each character as faithfully as possible, even the ones that shouldn't have been in the game. Not to mention, the arcade mode's stories, as simple as they were, contained some usually hilarious rivalries, pitting two members of the roster against one another in the penultimate battle on each of those arcade ladders. Ratchet and Jack, for example, would go head-to-head -head at the end of their respective arcade ladders, because that's an obvious rivalry that everybody had wanted to see for years. Then there were some more out-there ones, like Sly and Nathan Drake fighting over who was the better thief, or Big Daddy hating Sackboy because the little sister was hugging Sackboy and that was too close for the Big Daddy, or my absolute favorite one, Kratos and Sweet Tooth fighting over spilled ice cream. If absolutely nothing else, the game had charm. The people behind it showed their care. All-Stars even won the title of Fighting Game of the Year at 2012's DICE Awards over games like Tekken Tag Tournament 2, Persona 4 Arena, Soul Calibur, and Street Fighter Cross Tekken. That, that last one's not much of a surprise, it's just worth throwing out there because PlayStation's Cole and Toro are actually guest characters in that game, so that's kind of neat. The huge sticking points, however, were with the game's presentation and production value. From the long loading screens, a classic PlayStation 3 staple, to a painfully basic set of menus, themes, and user interface that the team didn't have time to finalize during that endgame crunch, to visuals that looked good, but not great, to the often choppy netcode, numerous audio-visual bugs, and even according to some, a lackluster story with the game's arcade modes. There was a lot to criticize. 
The hope seemed to be that with some post-game support, All-Stars could grow into a very respectable first game in a long-running series, just as its inspiration had. Superbot was a very young team itself, with many of them drawing from experience with fighting games rather than with game design itself, and although that's more common today for people to turn fan-turned-designer, even now it'll usually lead to growing pains. The core gameplay was fun, but people wanted more than just an arcade ladder and some online functionality. That fun part, though, did come with a caveat, and that caveat was character balance. For all the praise the game received as a more casual party game, Battle Royale's super system instantly caused problems on the more competitive side of things. Supers didn't follow a set pattern. Many of them may have followed similar themes, such as a level 1 super being a short charge forward or a level 3 being a complete screen clear, but these weren't distributed evenly among the characters. As a result, fighters like Raiden quickly rose to the top of the tier list due to having three fully viable supers, while others, such as Sir Dan, fell to the bottom thanks to how situational his moves were. And remember, supers are the only way to kill. That's the only way you can score a point. The only way you can take a stock is by connecting with a super move. So for some characters to have wildly better supers than the others was a massive balancing oversight. Some of this, even after the game got delayed from October to November, came down to that last minute crunch. Sackboy had a level 3 super that took very little time to build up, but lasted way too long and could result in anywhere from 4 to 6 guaranteed kills in 4 player free for all. Even worse, some characters had kill confirms, regular attacks that could combo directly into a super and a kill, and even these were hoarded by the higher tier characters. At one point, Raiden had a dozen ways to combo into his level 1 or 2 supers, practically every move he could use would guarantee a super kill, while Jack sat there with none. This meant that in 1v1 situations, you would be at a huge disadvantage with several of the roster because you'd have to do significantly more damage to get to your level 2 super or your level 3 super all while jumping around constantly to avoid being comboed into a kill confirm by somebody spamming Square as Raiden or Kratos or Dante. It's actually because of this that All-Stars had far better legs as a 2 vs 2 fighter, where these issues could be worked around by way of, well, you know, teamwork. And then, there's Kratos. Designed to be the Mario of this game, a recognizable, easy-to-pick-up character with a low ceiling, Kratos had, and still has, insane priority, fantastic range, and fast super buildup. And I'm talking purely about his square attacks. Kratos was the most common character you would see online at launch because, well, he was so easy to play, and also, he was the first character on the character select screen. Key issues with Kratos' balance turned thousands of players off of the game almost immediately, as Square to Win became the norm in both the casual and ranked online modes. With no incentive to learn the game's mechanics via its online when Square to Win dominated those early days on the servers, with a short single-player offering for each character and with a painfully limited training mode, All-Stars quickly affirmed that public reputation that it had been given seven months prior, a bad Smash clone. Comments litter the internet discussing how players only tried the game for an hour and hated it, how nothing felt right because it wasn't Smash, and Battle Royale was painted as a failure despite a decent critical response and sales that were apparently above Sony's expectations. Nevertheless, Superbot, Sony, and PlayStation's Santa Monica studio that had helped incubate the game's production, they carried on with their original outline, promising multiple waves of DLC characters and stages as they had planned for the entire production cycle. The goal quite clearly was to make this game, keep supporting it for a couple years, and be able to drop some sort of PlayStation 4 title after building all of that momentum and goodwill. Right? Well, hold that thought for now. First, let's talk about the DLC packs. First came Gravity Rush's Cat and Starhawk's Emmett Graves as two new playable fighters, two characters that had debuted after All-Stars was well into development, along with a Heavenly Sword stage that crossed over with a racetrack from Wipeout. Cat, in particular, was a heavily requested character, as I'm sure you can guess with how Gravity Rush fans absolutely never shut the hell up about Gravity Rush. Hi, I'm also Gravity Rush fans. Play those games, please. They're, they're really good. This DLC was announced around launch and would land in February 2013, and they would be free to own for anybody that downloaded them in those first two weeks that they were out. 
After that, every few months we would get another duo of downloadable fighters, stretching out at least a year, and according to some accounts, the plan went out as far as two years. This promising DLC strategy, as well as the post-launch patches that Superbot continued to deliver at a pretty rapid tick, helped flesh the gameplay's quirks out, balancing moves, closing up some kill confirms, and so on. Superbot staff even remained incredibly active on the game's official forums, reading about issues, responding, discussing, holding giveaways, as I, uh, as I had mentioned, and even donating money to help one of the forum's users afford a Vita to play it. Again, the folks on the ground floor, they cared. But then, only about four months into this plan, the shoe dropped. During the week before Cat and Emmett's release, Sony announced that it had cut ties with Superbot and that Santa Monica Studio would take the reins on all future development for PlayStation All-Stars. We'll get to Santa Monica in a sec, so keep them in your mind for a bit, but first, according to one former Superbot employee, Sony was expecting the game to perform very well in Europe despite its very limited advertising there, and the game simply didn't. Even though the game overperformed enough elsewhere, like in the States, to more than make up for the slightly lower European sales, this gave PlayStation its excuse to end the experiment prematurely. This was, sadly, a common occurrence in the PS3 era. PlayStation had a baffling number of titles that it dropped like a forgotten toy if any one single metric so much as looked at them funny. Part of that comes with a massive company full of different people in positions of power making independent decisions, of course, and part comes with experimentation in an era where you didn't really have mid-priced games quite yet. It was either full price or a $15 download. I mean, you're not really going to expect a game like Starhawk to be a huge hit at 60 bucks, although that didn't stop them from marketing it as the next blockbuster PlayStation 3 game. A game like Mod Nation Racers was a stellar little card game that died solely so that Sony could have the same developer make a different card game in Little Big Planet Karting and capitalize on a higher name series using a game that did the same thing, but it failed miserably because Little Big Planet Karting sold worse and almost killed two franchises for the price of one. And in between those two racing games, Sony released multiple other racing or car adjacent games, like two Motorstorm games and one Twisted Metal, before both of those series also died in 2012. Sly Cooper never performed all that well commercially, and Sony knew that, but still greenlit a fourth game, only to cut support for that game before the planned DLC chapter, leaving us with a cliffhanger where Sly is stuck in ancient Egypt forever, to this day. Can you fault Sony for greenlighting four different full-priced FPS games that released between 2010 and 2011? Yes. Yes, you can. Three of those games came out in 2011. They were constantly competing with themselves, even in the same damn genre constantly shooting themselves in the foot. I can keep going, but you can see where the publisher's skittish tendency to flee the very moment they felt a slight breeze sort of made it hard for anybody to trust any of their products by this point outside of God of War and Uncharted. Now, while all of this context is helpful in hindsight in a retrospective look like this, it didn't really matter back then. The fact of the matter was, All-Stars lived up, or maybe lived down, to the expectation it had been saddled with since it was first revealed. Hell, since it was first leaked months before it was revealed. Its fate was as a failed Smash clone, the kind of game destined to be clowned on until it was eventually forgotten. Meanwhile, the folks that had poured so much of their soul into fighting that destiny, into providing a genuinely fun game that could hopefully maybe be more than the cynical takeaway everybody had immediately jumped to, they were out of a job. To quote a different former Superbot employee, I don't really know the details, but all of us in the trenches felt betrayed. We were promised all sorts of support, getting characters and marketing, etc., and it never materialized. Then it felt like they just dumped us. It was really sad. Superbot was totally blindsided by this announcement, with employees crying at their desks as the inevitable layoffs were about to come. This was Superbot's first and last game before it shut its doors. But PlayStation All-Stars? It wasn't done fighting just yet. Cat and Emmett were not the final two characters that Battle Royale received. In March, two more characters dropped, both <laughs> as advertisements for new games. A really great look given the backlash those advertisement characters in the base game had gotten. These characters were Zeus as a plug aligning with God of War Ascension's launch, and also a way to break the one per franchise rule once again, excellent, and Isaac to promote the iconic PlayStation franchise, Dead Space, whose third game had dropped in February. The DLC was even offered as a free voucher to those that bought Ascension. However, the steady community that had stuck with this game 
did not take kindly to these two characters being the next ones up, and there was a marked shift in tone regarding All-Stars after Superbot had left. Updates, both for the game itself and for its audience, slowed down, effectively stopping entirely within about that first month. That brings us back to Santa Monica Studio, one of PlayStation's most tenured and acclaimed developers, and the studio responsible for taking over All-Stars after Superbot was cut. As of 2022, they've pretty much only directly developed God of War games, as well as Kinetica, but for much of the studio's life, it acted as Sony's incubator for smaller teams. Games like the PS3's Warhawk, much of the Twisted Metal series, even indie games like Journey, they were often developed at or near Santa Monica's campus, although the studio itself didn't necessarily have a significant hand in actually making these games. They might lend a piece of advice here or there, or help with some tech support, issues or have a single team member dedicated to some of these projects, but by and large, Santa Monica made its games, and then off in the corner, some other games were being made too, with Santa Monica's name being slapped on the box. Santa Monica Studio did, however, have one major non-God of War project during these PS3 days. PlayStation All-Stars, but not now. See, production actually began here back in 2009 for All-Stars, but with the studio's lack of experience with fighting games, some feelers got sent out to other studios such as Naughty Dog before Sony decided that the best course of action was to actually create a whole new studio to take over the project. From that point forward, Superbot handled production, with Santa Monica acting almost as a publisher, not really touching the game to any significant degree directly, with the exception of Seth Killian, one of the founders of the EVO fighting game tournament series who had worked at Capcom as a consultant on games like Street Fighter 4 and Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Killian joined Santa Monica to act as the lead designer on PlayStation All-Stars in June 2012, mere months before it was scheduled to release. A little strange to hire a lead designer four months before release. More or less outside of Killian, though, Santa Monica was focused on God of War Ascension and sort of just got saddled with All-Stars, extra baggage that they weren't exactly equipped to handle. This wasn't their first rodeo acting as an online game's hospice care, though, as they had taken over post-launch production for 2012's Twisted Metal game, a game whose online multiplayer continued struggling for months on end due to persistent issues that they just couldn't figure out because it's kind of hard to send one or two people to fix a game that they didn't work on. So when Zeus and Isaac released, and were broken at that since, you know, Sony fired off the entire studio that was still working on balancing the previous two DLC characters, let alone these new unfinished ones, Santa Monica was sort of forced to land a plane with no engine. Or, or wings. It's a tough situation to be in, only made worse by the fact that nobody had taken the reins on PR or community management. It was just silence, followed by the occasional, oh, don't worry guys, the game's totally not dead, we promise. Any remaining fans started to dwindle, realizing that the game's life was simply going to come to a close as a still unbalanced, forgotten game, until a spark went off that rallied whatever was left of the All-Stars player base. Dart. The Legend of Dragoon is another game that I've talked about before, a Sony-produced PS1 RPG that has a very dedicated cult following. The game has never received a sequel, although there were cancelled plans for one that were revealed in 2012, shortly before Battle Royale's announcement. You can put two and two together here, the game was going to get representation in All-Stars. In the summer of 2013, players discovered that Dart, the protagonist of Dragoon, was scheduled to be a playable DLC character, along with Oddworld's Abe. In fact, work had already begun on Dart, although he wasn't in a playable state yet. A member of Superbot had played through the entirety of Dragoon to figure out a faithful moveset, and Dart's unique gimmick would be that he would permanently change into his powered-up Dragoon form with a different moveset and everything after using, presumably, his level 3 super. It wasn't just him or Abe either, info trickled out afterwards that work had begun on other DLC characters, characters like Tomba, characters like Ninja Gaiden's Ryu Hayabusa who would also have two fighting stances kinda like Dart, and others further that former Superbot staff have been more coy about discussing or revealing even years later. It appeared that these characters were envisioned as DLC to follow Kat and Emmett, but were quickly cut down in order to make room for advertising Zeus and Isaac. Considering that both Dart and Abe were two of the most frequently requested characters, and they both potentially got shafted to advertise f***ing Dead Space, the built-up tension between the fanbase and Santa Monica 
exploded. Players took to social media, petitioning, begging, or at times demanding that these two fan-favorite characters be finalized and released. Santa Monica, Sony Computer Entertainment Worldwide's President Shuei Yoshida, Seth Killian, they all got bombarded with tweets and messages as part of a coordinated hashtag release dark campaign, a campaign that began to trend on social media and actually reach major gaming news outlets, and a campaign that, <clears throat> that I my, myself may or may not have helped to organize. Um, sorry, sorry guys. At least we were just sending tweets and not mean or depraved things. We were just a bunch of nerds that wanted our RPG boy, our, 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 our anime-haired swordsman in Smash. <laughs> Knowing what we know now about Santa Monica's internal development around that time, from Ascension's reception signaling a player fatigue with God of War at the time, to PlayStation All-Stars actually outselling Ascension on PSN some months, which was not a good look for, at the time, the most successful PlayStation franchise this side of Gran Turismo, to the exhausting development of another unknown project that would get cancelled the following year, to the entire studio itself being prepped for a move to a brand new facility, knowing all of this, you feel for them. I mean, none of this was in their hands outside of their genuine communication issues at the time. Speaking of, within a few weeks of this backlash, Sony or Santa Monica, or both of them, somebody had worked out a solution. No new characters were going to be possible for the team since, you know, nobody on Santa Monica directly worked on the damn game. They even had to bring a couple Superbot employees back into Santa Monica just to get critical patches through in the couple weeks after Sony had cut ties. However, according to Santa Monica Studio, they would have a team work on a final balance patch to address multiple problems caused both by the DLC characters never getting enough time in the oven, as well as work on the game's balance as a whole with direct input from the community. This patch was scheduled for release in fall 2013. Development for that patch started in December of 2013, on actually the final official day of fall, by a team of one person. Eventually, it did release in April of 2014, well after the PlayStation 4 had launched, and well after the remaining community support for the game had dwindled even further. Although the servers would remain up until 2018, it really took just under two years after its original reveal for PlayStation All-Stars to exhale its final breath. With the exception of September 2014, when All-Stars was given away for free to PlayStation Plus subscribers, Sony has been almost entirely silent on this game since that balance patch released. Well, actually, that's not true. They did release a PlayStation All-Stars smartphone game exclusively in Europe in August 2013 to cash in on some Coke Zero sponsorship money, which said all you really need to know about how they really saw the brand around that point. When asked about the future of this series in 2013, Shuhei Yoshida said, never say never, and that he wished to come back to the All-Stars concept, but not necessarily the All-Stars mechanics. Whenever the title PlayStation All-Stars is uttered, online or elsewhere, not far behind it are comments calling the game a failure, or dunking on it, or moving on. In recent years, even the world of gaming press has shifted its tone. Now, whenever one references All-Stars, a snide Smash Bros. remark is sure to follow. Superbot's little game that could, just couldn't escape Nintendo's shadow. There are a lot of what-ifs that you can throw out with this game. What if it hadn't been leaked months before reveal, priming the most tuned-in of hashtag gamers to be armed and ready to hate it before actual gameplay was shown? What if the game hadn't been immediately compared to the second or third Smash games? Or what if it had had more support from a more experienced developer? In that case, I genuinely think it would have had a successful lifespan, even without a company like Activision playing ball with Crash Bandicoot. As it stands, though, ifs don't really matter. Superbot made a game that many might want to forget, but that I don't think you should forget. Whether the mechanics may have clicked or not for you, whether you wanted Crash Bandicoot or not, even though the edgy version of Dante shouldn't have been in the game, PlayStation All-Stars was, at its core, made by its developers as a celebration, not just of all these wonderful characters and that version of Dante, but of you, the player, the person that had made all of it happen. The problem was that the publisher, Sony itself, didn't honestly have much worth celebrating. And that is the true final impact of PlayStation All-Stars, because its death really was, in my opinion, part of this wake-up call, that recognition internally within what we now know as PlayStation Studios that the players weren't buying in, and that the roster of actual Sony-owned characters was at that moment, at its least, iconic. 
After an entire console generation defined by the cocky start, the 599 US dollars, the giant enemy crab, Ridge Racer, the apparent assumption that their product would just keep printing money no matter what, all while a significant number of folks were jumping from the PlayStation 2 to the Xbox 360. After that start, after butting heads with itself multiple times in 2010, 2011, and 2012 with overlapping titles, with overpriced titles, to release a celebration game like this at the end of the year, at the end of the PlayStation's least successful console generation without really having all that much to celebrate? Something had to change. Look at that roster now. How many characters are currently relevant? Kratos, Sweet Tooth, maybe if the Peacock show lands well. Drake, sure. Ratchet and Sackboy, yeah, five-ish, not counting Aihachi. The game got flack back then for using the All-Stars branding while trotting out some third stringers. That was the best of the best that this company had to offer after nearly 20 years years. So as the company restructured internally, and just as importantly, as indie games continued to fill the gap left by the disappearance of smaller budget titles, PlayStation games had to become appointment viewing, had to become must buy games. It didn't happen right away, that is for damn sure. The Last of Us 1 may have set things on the right path, shut the hell up, not the time or the place, but games like Infamous Second Son, Killzone Shadowfall, Knack, The Order 1886, they were all already in the pipeline before this PlayStation All-Stars wake-up call. And studios like Sucker Punch and Guerrilla, although they may have found sales success, they, just like Santa Monica Studio after God of War Ascension, or just like Insomniac after Resistance 3, they had that rude awakening that maybe they had to change things up too to fit the ever-evolving market. And in the last five or so years especially, that seed of change that was planted right around here back in 2012 and 2013, it's been blooming. Games like Horizon or Ghost of Tsushima have blown their respective developers' earlier libraries out of the water in terms of success, both thanks to some damn fun gameplay, the most important part, and performances that established multiple new iconic mascots. Santa Monica, at the time of this recording, dropped the most successful PlayStation launch ever simply by evolving its iconic character. After even Sony's tried-and-true bellwether, Ratchet & Clank, a game whose sales had never really shifted, started having an uncharacteristic performance slump during the PS3 era, it was able to land with an entirely new audience and re-establish itself, and most notably, they've all been having fun with it, throwing little references to one another between studios, between games, embracing that Nintendo philosophy that if you like one of our games, you should definitely give this other one a shot. Could they maybe do that without so many of their games being this sort of over-the-shoulder third-person action game style, or with maybe, god forbid, a low-budget bone thrown to Ape Escape or something? Yes, please, that would be very cool, thank you, but also, obviously, the general player isn't the kind of person watching this video that maybe seeks out the insane Nintendo levels of variety. Most of those 20 million sales that a Horizon or God of War or Spider-Man or Uncharted are getting are people that really only play a couple games a year. How else do you think anybody gave a damn about Days Gone? And again, to be very clear here, this is not at all a straight line from this one game to the current place that Sony's games are in. It's just the final, biggest example in a line of shortcomings that helped force a complete rework of how this company approached games. And with this more unified approach, not to mention Sony's plans to drop a ton of service games to complement their single-player outings in the coming years, it's actually not a pipe dream anymore that a new PlayStation crossover game could happen. I don't expect it or anything, but we're already in the crossover era of gaming, where Kratos can hit the gritty on Master Chief in Fortnite, and the stigma around Smash Bros. clones has lightened up significantly since PlayStation took a ton of the heat. The entire Smash or Brawler genre, whatever you want to call it, is bigger and better than ever, and there's more room for people to come in and create their own spin on the idea than ever before. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, for one, was hyped to play as Perfect Cell in multiverses. Also, apropos of nothing, Sony owns EVO now, so, you know, it wouldn't be a bad call to have your own fighting game there. I, I don't know, just a shot in the dark. 
I believe it's crucial to acknowledge the full history of this game, because it's not just some footnote, it can pretty much be used to explain an entire chapter of the history of one of gaming's juggernauts. It's only become easier over the years, especially after Smash Ultimate, to poke at this game as a failure and clown on it for easy and very fair brownie points to get some extra hits on YouTube or whatever, all while getting basic information wrong. Now, obviously, I never said that I wasn't a biased source here, but I can put that aside when it comes to talking about the history as it happened. I mean, I don't love this game anymore, I should throw that out there. Like, it's a cool game, I have a soft spot for it, it's not, it's not, it's not very well designed. But on the note of that bias, it does sometimes bother me just a little bit to see so many people get those facts wrong, because Battle Royale had a profound impact on me. It pushed me into a community that I had no interest in, through which I met some close friends that I still talk with pretty much every day. This game became a bit of a gateway for me to dig into other fighting games as well, not to mention that it directly led to me falling in love with The Legend of Dragoon and going out of my way to experience or re-experience a ton of RPGs that I had maybe tried and put down when I was younger, and for that, I'm grateful. It gave me a newfound appreciation for community as a whole, as running one of the larger fan forums for the game for a couple years, and even working on a very short-lived All-Stars Smash Bros. crossover fan game, that lit this desire in me to create this sort of community for others. It reminded me how much I loved analyzing games and game design, breaking this stuff down, because uh, sometimes going outside ain't cool. Without PlayStation All-Stars, I don't think this channel, The Golden Bolt, would exist, and I'd be on a very different path in life. There'd be a lot more people that I consider friends and even family that I wouldn't know. I continue to think about All-Stars every now and then from a historical perspective, and every time I do, I put other pieces together about how man, this game did a lot, none of which was what it actually set out to do. So. Everything else aside, as far as what impacts this game may or may not have had, I wanted one more time, 10 years later, to lend my voice to give PlayStation All-Stars the voice that it lost, or maybe that it never really had, to tell the story that actually happened. That's the very least that I can do for a game that, well, it helped give me my voice. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, stay golden. This video is brought to you by the wonderful and generous crew of supporters on this Patreon list right here. If you want to see your name on this list, get early access to videos, or access to the patron-only Golden Cult Discord server, it's still not a cult, I promise, I checked, you can do so for as little as a dollar at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. Thank you.